Um, so, okay, hello, hello everyone. Thank you, thank you again uh, for joining today's seminar. My name is David Rodriguez. I'm a system engineer at EPFL Space Center. And uh, today we have the pleasure of having with us uh, Romeo, Loren, and Elise, who are going to present to us their work uh, titled Can an Airship Explore Mars? A preliminary feasibility study for an airship operated on the red planet. Um, before I let them maybe introduce themselves, so Pierre, I think, I think you, you're planning on introducing the project. Um, just a few housekeeping rules to keep in mind. As always, please keep your mics uh, muted. Also, uh, as you notice, uh, the video stream is being recorded and it will be uploaded later on on our YouTube channel. So if you don't want your uh, face showing up, please switch off your, your cameras. Uh, there will be enough time for a Q&A at the end of the presentation. So please write down your questions in the chat or if you, if you would rather ask them live, um, uh, later on, raise your, your virtual hand and then you will have a chance to ask your question directly at the end. Um, and I think that's all. Uh, thank you everyone again. And uh, thanks to the speakers for making the time. And now Pierre, I think the floor is all yours. Thank you, David. Well, um, I'm Pierre Buisson, president of the Mars Society Switzerland. We, we have orbiters around Mars looking to the ground from far above. We have rovers on the ground to scrutinize and analyze the ground from very close. We have now the helicopter ingenuity uh, to look around uh, uh, the terrain around the, the rover. Uh, but uh, we miss something, and this, this something is the airship, because an airship has an autonomy uh, thanks to, to the lift that it gets, uh, has an autonomy much larger, much longer than uh, the helicopter. So uh, this is why we're, we are interested in, in, this, uh, in this airship. Uh, the difficulty, of course, as everybody realized, is a very thin atmosphere of Mars. We, we have some lift, but we have very limited lift because uh, atmospheric pressure is only 610 Pascal average. And uh, so we have to uh, deal with, uh, as little as uh, with as little mass as possible. And this is really the, the challenge. So uh, you will see what uh, uh, the preliminary study of this project, which has been led by, uh, by three people mainly, uh, that is uh, Romeo Tonasso, who made his um, semester paper on the subject, and under the guidance of, uh, uh, of uh, Alice Barth, uh, who is an ESA engineer, and uh, Lorraine Del Subche, who is an uh, Ariane Espace Group engineer. And uh, we were together, uh, Claude Nicoli and myself, to, well, to, to have a look at what they were doing and to give uh, our own guidance. So the floor now is to Romeo. Yes, hello. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Pierre. Uh, so as Pierre said, uh, I did my uh, semester project on this uh, topic. Uh, last year, actually, and uh, so I had uh, I was lucky enough to have a uh, lot of guidance from Pierre, Claude Nicolier, and Lauren and Alice, and uh, we also eventually presented the project uh, to a conference and uh, submitted a paper. So we'll present to you uh, basically how far we went with this project and uh, what the next steps are. And I don't know if there's anything more to add uh, on my side. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, we can go. All right, I'll take uh, the lead. Thank you, uh, Pierre and Romeo, for this introduction. So the big question we've asked ourselves during the past year is the following. Can an airship explore Mars? So our team developed a feasibility study of a balloon as a mean of exploration on a planet with barely any atmosphere. This project was initiated by the Mars Society Switzerland, and it's more specifically its president here, uh, Pierre Brisson, and uh, the Moon Mars Group. Um, and, you know, R R Romeo quickly joined uh, the team uh, and, take, and took on this project as uh, his semester project. 
Uh, now, as you might know, space missions usually take a bit more than a few months to prepare, so uh, bear with us. The presentation simply covers the main physical principles behind the idea, the types of technologies existing and in, existing and in development uh, used to achieve lift on the red planet. The issues of the transport to Mars and its deployment on this planet were not addressed. Thank you, Vincent. So what's the, motiva what's the motivation behind our study? Why an airship? The Red Planet already has landers, rovers, even helicopters now. Well, if we have a look at each system, we can see that orbiters provide a global coverage, but a coarse resolution. For example, the CRISM spectral is only at 18 meter precision. Now, landers and rovers are able to closely observe and even mine regolite in some cases, but uh, not only are they quite slow, uh, they're unable to travel over rough terrain. Now, to give you a scale, for example, Perseverance maximum speed is 153 meters per hour. So the scale that you can uh, explore uh, with rovers is a little bit limited. Now, finally, flying machines. Ingenuity made history recently with a flight demonstration and a few flight demonstrations now. Uh, now, as the system is extremely recent and therefore the literature is limited, it's a bit harder to provide pros and cons. Nonetheless, so the short duration of ingenuity flights, only a few minutes long, raised the concern that a helicopter might need a little extra atmospheric push in order to cover long distances. Thank you, um, Vincent. Now, the thematic of a Martian airship has historically been addressed by NASA and other space agencies, mostly at the end of 1990s, beginning of 2000s. Now, here we give three examples. First off, NASA's Mars Aerobot Balloon Study, led between end of 1990s to beginning of 2001, which developed a high altitude balloon. You can see uh, and one of the image, the middle one uh, was extracted from a presentation given by a NASA engineer. Uh, now, this had the disadvantage of not having any altitude control. Um, which is actually a point we'll develop later on. Now, the CNES, the French space agency, also developed its own um, project called Montgolfière Infrarouge, MIR, um, which had its last, last flight in 2004. Now, it was a development of, the, of a, a balloon heated by the sun at an altitude between 20 and 30 kilometers above Earth. Now, you can see a, um, a, a representation of the balloon on the right side of this slide. Now, finally, more recently, uh, Thales Alina Space uh, began studying in 2016 an autonomous stratospheric airship. Now, this uh, project has currently been uh, put on pause for now on hold, uh, but it definitely maintains and, and proves the interest uh, behind uh, the exploration through airships. Now, the purpose of our study is to further investigate the feasibility of controlling the airship instead of leaving it free floating, also leveraging improvements of performance for critical technologies. Next, please. Now, Martian atmosphere. To give a, a, a general background, as you, as most of you know, I imagine, uh, there's a lot of carbon dioxide, 95% precisely, uh, with 3% of nitrogen and 1.6% of argon and traces of many other gases. Now, as uh, Pierre mentioned earlier in the presentation, the average surface pressure is extremely low, which it's about 1% of the Earth's value. Now, to give uh, an equivalent, the highest atmospheric density on Mars is equal to the density found at 35 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Uh, as a difference, uh, Mount Everest is about 8 kilometers. Now, the data we, we used for the, Martian, for the Martian atmosphere and the calculations around it were extracted from the Mars Climate Database, which is a, which is a, a project led, a model developed by NASA. As a, by NASA's Mars General Circulation Model. And it provides atmospheric information for given coordinates, Martian time, solar longitude, and altitude. So the way we proceeded was the following. First off, we chose an altitude range which create, uh, between the location's depth and the zero kilometer datum. Secondly, a solar longitude and an altitude values were fixed. And with those values fixed, we could determine the pressure and temperature and density values as a function of hour. And Eventually, the altitude is incremented, and once all altitudes are incremented, the uh, solar longitude is incremented, and all uh, altitudes probed again. So the, the cycle the cycle continues. Next slide, please. So the design reference mission DRM refers to the elaboration of the condition under which an airship could sustain a lift on Mars for a certain amount of hours. So, for example, one of the first thing it did was define our operation zone, operating zone. Sorry. Now, with an atmosphere so thin, you can imagine that Mount Olympus would not be the best candidate. The higher the altitude, the lower the pressure. 
So instead, a canyon was selected for our study, Valles Marineris, and more specifically, the valley of Melas Casma, which is wide enough for an airship to navigate. Now, if you, can, if you look at the image there, you can see that the widest part of it is about 60 kilometers wide. So it's more than enough for an airship, to, even uh, uh, an airship of a, a consequent size, it's enough for it to travel without any, well, with, yeah, without any obstacles. Uh, now, the canyon presents multiple geomorphological and astrobiological advantages, in addition to a low and constant width, which we will show later on. Now, the goal of the airship would be to explore the cliffs near the bottom of the valley using a hyperspectral camera, which would give us a unique insight in identifying the geological material and, and detecting historical processes. Next, please. So an additional advantage to Valles Marineris is its position. Now, indeed, the closer our airship is to the equator, the better, as this implies easier weather conditions. Now, a sol, a sol longitude of 270 degrees ensured the meteorological conditions were optimal. Now, once the mission was well elaborated and the environment's constraints were clearly defined and optimized, a system design approach was conducted. The envelope was side and the propulsion method was developed. But first of all, let's have a look at uh, the wind study that we, that we uh, obtained. Next, please. Now, as you can see, uh, there's two wind estimations that we did. First, southwest, and second is southwest Melascasma and east Melascasma. Now, you can see that those are 10 meters above local surface and 1,000 meters above local surface. This gives us a general idea of the, of, of, uh, the um, of the behavior, sorry, of the wind. Now, as you can see, there's no vertical winds in both 10 and 1,000 meters uh, high, which is a great advantage for us for the altitude control. Now, if you go to the next slide too, you can see the same study with the east Melascasma. And in addition, you can see that both for 10 and 1,000 meters, there is no vertical winds. Uh, I leave now the mic to Romeo, who will present, Alice, sorry, who will present uh, the uh, rest of the presentation. Yep, no, that's me. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so the first question was how to generate a lift. Uh, the straightforward way would be to proceed like on Earth. So basically have an envelope that we fill with a gas that is lighter than air, uh, so-called so lighter than air, uh, meaning a lower density. The issue, uh, as Lauren said, is uh, that the, the atmosphere is very thin. So it's the equivalent of what we find at a 35 kilometer altitude on Earth. So one alternative would be to consider a vacuumed envelope, and this is actually studied by uh, NASA, among others. Um, because the atmospheric pressure is much lower than on Earth, you could have a structure that is rigid enough to be vacuumed inside, and that wouldn't collapse. But the problem with this is that it's very uh, demanding on the materials, because obviously it needs to be very stiff. So we did a quick comparison uh, of the two. And uh, on Mars, the loss of having uh, an envelope that is filled with hydrogen is uh, 7%. So it's very, it's almost negligible. And in addition to that, we don't have the risk uh, of uh, combustion because there's no oxygen in the atmosphere. So the vacuum concept is an interesting one. And probably in the future, it could be uh, something that is uh, worth looking at. But we selected a more classical envelope that is filled with hydrogen. So if you go to the next slide, please. Yeah, thanks a lot. So still, there are quite a lot of requirements on the envelope material, and it is quite demanding because obviously we need a very lightweight material, but it, that is also tear resistant and it has a low permeability to retain the inner gas. And also on top of that, we need to survive the environment. So that's the reason why we opted for a composite material that is made of three layers. So you have Vectron that is used for the load bearing. So basically it's a, it's a woven fabric uh, that really does the, well, the load bearing uh, aspect. And it doesn't elongate a lot and it has a high tear resistance. Then there's Mylar that uh, really retains the inner gas. Uh, it has a very low permeability and it's often used for such uh, applications. And finally, there's an outer layer that protects uh, the, the other materials, especially from UV uh, and all kinds of uh, weathering. And the hole is bounded by a banana adhesive that also helps with the, with the permeability. On the next slide, please. Yep, thanks a lot. 
So we have this uh, composite envelope. And uh, the question now is, um, so we chose to have hydrogen to fill it and that we don't vent any of the hydrogen. Um, I didn't mention it, but the reason why we go for hydrogen is obviously it's very low density, but also because it could be obtained on site with electrolysis. Uh, so a few assumptions were made, uh, especially that it's a stable ideal gas at ambient temperature. And here you have the governing equation that states that the liftable mass depends on the atmospheric density, the lifting gas density, the envelope volume, and the surface density of the envelope. So basically the, the whole mass of the envelope. So this shows that the best shape is the spherical one because you optimize the surface to volume ratio. Um, so obviously uh, that's the most preferable one. And there's a lot less need for aerodynamic shapes on Mars than on Earth, uh, because we have less um, uh, we have less uh, dynamic pressure. So we opted for the spherical uh, the spherical uh, shape. Um, one thing that's important to note, though, is that the sizing of the other subsystem is based on a certain envelope size. So as we add mass, we need to increase the radius of the envelope, but that also increases the weight of the envelope. So it's a bit of a loop uh, that you have here to find uh, really the equilibrium between the mass that you are lifting and the mass of your whole system. So as a first assumption, uh, we chose a 500 kilogram liftable mass. So that includes everything um, but the weight one. Well, that is already accounting for the weight of the envelope, let's say. And if we want to go as high as minus 2,000 meters, so we are in the canyon, so we are in negative altitudes, uh, that means uh, on a radius of almost 23 meters. So as you can see, it's a quite large uh, balloon that we have here. So on the next slide, please. Thanks. Um, actually, I will let Alice talk about this, sorry. Yes, thank you, Romeo. Um, so now uh, that we have uh, this balloon floating, uh, we'd like it not to crash on the side of a cliff. Uh, so what we are going to uh, talk about now is uh, the proportion that we have been looking at. So we have been uh, investigating different ways of, um, of uh, different proportion options, um, but we mostly studied the, prope the simple propeller one. Um, and in order to do that, we had to take some assumption uh, so, as you would imagine, uh, the, as you know, the thrust, the, sorry, the drag is proportional to the square of the speed, while, and, and so the power would be proportional to the cubic of the speed. So, the very critical uh, variable to know is what is the maximum wind speed against which we have to fight, essentially. Um, in that case, we led a, a, a short study on the zone uh, that Lorraine described earlier, uh, using uh, essentially the Mars Climate Database and found out that uh, 10 meters per second uh, was um, a good, probably a good uh, uh, value to take because it covers most of the meteorological uh, conditions on that zone and on the altitude we are aiming at. So uh, this is the value went with. Um, Something else we wanted to estimate was uh, a coefficient called the thrust coefficient. In order to do so, uh, we looked at uh, ingenuity data and kind of derived it from uh, this because, uh, of course, ingenuity propeller has been designed to uh, work in the Martian atmosphere, even though um, it's not exactly the same altitude. Um, so uh, when it comes to the design, uh, the thing that is the most important to know would be the length of the blades, uh, and it's a critical parameter in deriving most of the performance of the blade, let's say. Uh, so here you can find uh, some equations on how to derive the necessary power to fight against the wind that we have chosen, 10 meters per second. Um, and then also how you can derive the propeller thrust uh, as a function of uh, the length of the blade and uh, the rotation rates, like the number of um, rounds per second, right? Um, so this is what you have here. And essentially, we have to navigate between two constraints. The first constraint is that uh, this propeller allows us to fight against that wind, so 10 meters per second. Uh, so that's the first one, and that's on that graph here, you would see as the blue line, um, min minimum velocity to compensate drag, 
uh, and um, then the second uh, constraint in which we are navigating in that we want that uh, the tip of the blade to remain subsonic, which means uh, not break the barrier of sound. So we took a 10% margin for this. Uh, and this is what you see here. Um, so on that graph here, you have on the y-axis, the rotation velocity uh, in number of revolutions per second. And on the x-axis, you have the propeller diameter. And essentially what we find, uh, and it's in logarithmic scale, which is why it's um, straight. Uh, and essentially what you can find is that there is a kind of a critical point that is also the optimal point uh, that gives us a regime of the blade. Uh, uh, so the optimum number of revolutions per second, as well as the diameter of the propeller. And this is how we designed it. Um, now, uh, this gives us, I mean, this is one methodology to derive the number of the blade, but of course we will have to refine this with further aerodynamical and mechanical analysis. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Vincent, oh, thanks. Um, now that we have an idea of how big our blade is and how much power we need to um, to spend on that, uh, we are able to design the um, electrical budget of uh, that airship. So we took some assumption on you know how the onboard data uh, handling processing, uh, essentially the the brain of the airship was going to take, but of course the main driver for the power is the drag uh, for that we have to, um, that we have to fight against the wind. Um, so in order to do so, what we did is that we considered uh, a constant speed of 10 meters per second throughout the day, and we sized our system to be able to essentially fight against that wind for a whole day, just taking uh, the sun energy. So we investigated different uh, uh, we consider different options as how to generate power, uh, but after some trade-off, we realized that probably um, classical power cells and uh, battery was the easiest way. Uh, so keeping that, keeping that in mind and uh, looking at, again, the Mars Climate Database, we look at the worst case scenario, so that would be the winter solstice, uh, because this is where you have less uh, sunlight. Uh, we looked at how much irradiance we would expect to come um, on the airship at the considered altitude and the considered zones, the considered latitude, essentially. Um, and so uh, that gives us, uh, let's say, an average power that we have throughout the day and helped us size on the one side the batteries that we would need and on the other side the um, surface of power cells that we needed to be able to generate enough energy to essentially uh, go throughout the day. Um, and for that, we uh, suppose uh, some kind of state of the art viable. So, for example, we suppose that we had uh, a battery with an energy, energy density of 400 uh, watt per kilograms um, and this kind of thing. So, essentially, that is uh, how, what equations, what hypothesis we use to size this power system and uh, everything associated with them. And again, uh, derive the mass budget from that. Um, so that's it on my side, I believe. If also, if you go to the next slide, I will, uh, oh, I forgot about this slide. Okay, uh, so essentially that's what I was saying uh, about the solar cell and battery. Uh, and this is how we derived all the, all the variables. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, then I would uh, leave the floor to Romeo once again to kind of uh, describe this mass budget that we started talking about. Yep, thanks a lot. Um, so here you have a little mass budget of the whole system. Uh, it's not very detailed, obviously, because it's a preliminary study, but uh, still. So as I said, we have a, an initial assumed uh, payload of 500 kilograms. So you have the main components here, so the battery. Uh, the batteries account for a huge part of, uh, of those 500 kilograms, uh, the whole propulsion, the inner balloon, the solar panels, and so and so. Uh, but that still leaves a quite large margin. So of those 500 kilograms, we still have uh, 318, almost 319 kilograms uh, for all the things that were not sized precisely. So for instance, the structure, uh, the pump, antenna, and board computer, and such. And the envelope mass uh, is uh, 284 kilograms. So that means that the whole thing would be 784 kilograms. So that's the complete systems mass. So on the next slide, please. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, so a little summary here. Uh, so the first thing is that the numerical results are nice, uh, but 
Uh, what's more, more important about this study are the governing equations, because if, uh, we link them all in an Excel spreadsheet, um, also MATLAB code, uh, whatever. Uh, but the point is that we can easily vary the inputs, and uh, that means we can adapt to different scenarios or to different technologies uh, simply by changing, for instance, uh, the surfacing density of solar, solar cells or things like this. Uh, so this is really the added value, uh, I would say, of this study. A uh, quick recall of the numerical results still. Uh, so the envelope is 23 meters in uh, radius. Uh, it needs two propellers of 4.12 meters diameter. Uh, there's 30 square meter of solar panels, 113 kilograms of batteries, and the whole mass is 784 kilograms, as I said. Uh, the next slide, please. Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, so a little bit about the future work, and then I'll let uh, Vincent, Florentin, and Michael talk more about it. But um, so yes, we found the conditions under which it is physically possible to fly and control an airship on Mars, and we identified potential technologies to do so. But there are lots of other elements uh, to be considered in order to move to a real uh, mission design, I would say. Um, for instance, the inner balloon, so for now, uh, we believe this is a good concept to, to control the altitude, but it will need um, detailed design and operational scenarios. Obviously, the architecture of the whole thing. So you have a representation here of what it could be. Um, it is everything is, uh, is, uh, is to the scale. So if you consider that the, the propellers are four meters in diameter, you can see that the balloon is quite, uh, quite huge. Um, so yeah, a mechanical analysis as well, uh, and also a deeper study of telecoms. So how we proceed to gather data, to treat them and to send them, and also how we navigate. That's a quite important point since we are in a canyon, quite large one, but still uh, it's a canyon. And finally, a really critical point is how to transport the airship to Mars and how to deploy it safely. And that would probably be the most uh, constraining point uh, in order to really move to a more, uh, let's say, um, credible uh, mission design. And I will now let uh, the future team uh, speak about their work for the semester to come. Thank you, Romeo. Thanks a lot. So hi, everyone. I'm uh, first, I'm really glad to take part in this project. I will focus more on the envelope material and shape. I will investigate different solutions and using a trade-off analysis, my goal is to define some requirements for this envelope. Thanks, Vincent. Uh, I will be working on the propulsion and attitude altitude control because we want to have an airship that is controllable horizontally and vertically. And for that, I'll do some, uh, some trade-off analysis and uh, some, uh, um, some work on the, on the blade, blade that will be able to steer our airship in the thin uh, Mars atmosphere. And I'm looking forward to work on uh, this topic. Yeah, thank you, uh, Florenta. Uh, so I will be working on the navigation and data handling, also on telecommunications. So I want to find out how are we going to communicate the data that we gather on Mars back to Earth. I also want to be able to find out how we're going to be able to, to localize our, our airship, how we're going to be able to steer it, and all of these interesting questions. And I look forward to working on this for the coming semester. So. Yeah. Okay. So uh, eventually, yeah. uh, so eventually the goal, uh, as as Romeo mentioned, uh, we presented this paper last uh, this year at the GLEX conference in 2021 in St. Petersburg, um, and we're hoping that uh, with the work done this year, we'll be able to present uh, papers at the next uh, IAC, which will take place in Paris um, in September 2022. So this is uh, the objective of uh, the semester for us. And uh, finally, next slide, please. Thank you so much to uh, Pierre Brisson and Claude Nicolier, uh, who mentored us all this year um, along along this project and really led us to to 
in order to, to do a study as, as developed and uh, precise as possible. And thank you to all for coming today. Thank you, Lorraine. It was really a pleasure to work with you, uh, all the three. And uh, well, we are very glad to have uh, now a new team uh, keeping uh, with us to, in order that we go, we can go further, which is very, uh, well, because we have still a lot of work to do. Um, I just want to stress that, uh, as you see, we cannot uh, use uh, this uh, airship to go uh, anywhere. Uh, but uh, in fact, this is not a problem because the most important is that it will allow us to explore vertical cliffs. And we have a lot of interesting uh, sites in Mars, on Mars uh, uh, with these cliffs. And these cliffs will be the best place to look at the historical as uh, the uh, history of geology of Mars. So this is why really this is something which be, will be useful. Uh, another remark is that, uh, as you see, uh, we have uh, uh, 318 kilos uh, left to use. And of course, this should give us uh, enough to, to the, um, for what is needed to, to complete the most important, which will be the uh, spectrometer uh, to, to, to observe the cliffs. And a uh, last remark is that uh, it seems to, that the propeller diameter is very uh, large, uh, 4.12 meter, which is a lot, but uh, it's a lot if you compare it to plane propeller, it's not so much if you compare it to an helicopter propeller. So, uh, well, it seems that it, will, it is a difficult project, but it doesn't seem impossible. So let's hope. And thank you, everybody. Now we go to question and answer. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Um, and thank you to the team uh, for, the, for the interesting presentation. Um, we already have questions in the chat, so we'll go ahead and, and just read those. Um, and whoever you think is uh, must, must answer those, uh, feel free. So the first question we have is, uh, why does the tip of the blades need to stay subsonic? Uh, just uh, in terms of facility of operations, this avoids, you know, having to pass that uh, subsonic, uh, supersonic uh, wall where uh, essentially the control would become very, very hard because it would be highly nonlinear and uh, have switch in between operation modes. So um, that was our main assumption, but maybe we could explore that if we see that is really too complicated to go um, to, to do without um, supersonic speeds. Yeah, it's also causes a lot of uh, structural problems mm -hmm. when you go supersonic, so it's not ideal. Awesome. Um, another question. Uh, what are the possibilities of testing the project on Earth? So we're not quite there yet, honestly, uh, <laughs> as you can imagine. So we mentioned the diameter of a, a radius of about 23 meters. Uh, it's quite colossal, so obviously it would not be in scale. Plus, you have to reproduce the Martian conditions. Uh, we've Once again, we've, we've, there's a bit of literature on how they manage to do it for ingenuity, but one that's a, a tiny helicopter. Um, so in comparison, our uh, airship would be a bit more difficult to uh, <laughs> to to test. Yep. So right now we're con concentrating on numerical simulations um, to to develop um, something as close to testing as possible. Yeah, just to add a bit on that, you know, ingenuity. Uh, so the way it was tested, essentially, the two things that you have to reproduce to be similar is once the air density. So this can be quite easily done with a um, vacuum chamber if your system is reasonably small. Uh, and secondly, and this is much more hard to simulate, is the gravity, which is one third of, of what you find on Earth. Um, so actually what they did with Ingenuity is that it was somewhat linked to a tether that was removing two thirds of is a mass of Ingenuity. So all the tests they could do on Earth was just vertical things and they were not quite able to go sideways. Uh, so uh, you can imagine 
that essentially gravity is the hardest thing uh, to simulate on Earth, to answer your question. Indeed, indeed. Gravity is always our, uh, you know, the, the thing we always have to fight here. And uh, there, is a, there is an interesting question about power generation. Uh, and the question in particular asked about um, how about the use of uh, nuclear power instead of, instead of solar? Uh, energy and and there's an interesting comment uh, from from Anton Ivanov saying that you also have to consider planetary protection policies um, and you know nuclear nuclear and planetary protection is always a tricky aspect to 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 talk about uh, but even in solar like how have you thought about where to place those panels how you to use those um, um, I don't know any any more information on that. Uh, yes. So first on uh, nuclear power uh, RTGs, I guess. Uh, yes, I have looked into it at first, uh, but I realized it would be too uh, too complex first because it doesn't produce that much power, and also because there are a lot of uh, issues with uh, regulations and things like this. Um, so maybe it could be considered, but I don't think it could be used as the sole uh, power source. No, I think you would still need something else. Uh, regarding the solar panels, uh, we have several options. Uh, one of them would be to put the cells directly on the envelope. Um, because we have such a large envelope, we could place them like literally uh, on half of the envelope and uh, we get permanent exposure. Um, the thing is, it adds weight. There are some other things to investigate that uh, Vincent uh, will uh, look in this semester, uh, such as um, photoelectrical. Um, uh, uh, what's so, the... so photosensitive, <laughs> uh, photosensitive textile. That's Essentially, it. you would have uh, the power generation would be kind of generated by tires that are um, th threads that are directly like embedded in the envelope material. So this decreases a lot the efficiency. Well, so like the highest you can get from today's solar cells is like 30%. Um, but because it would be kind of in, embedded in the envelope, you could really increase the, um, uh, the surface and this would compensate for the um, lack of uh, the loss of efficiency, let's say. Got it, okay. Um... And uh, uh, there is also a, a, a question or a comment like, have you have you looked at the state of the art on on balloons like the what the ones that uh, that flew on on Venus? So yeah, we mentioned uh, at the beginning of the presentation. Indeed, there's a few uh, projects that uh, considered uh, Martian balloons and generally um, balloons and airships as means of exploration um, from space agencies to come out of out of the lot. Let's say. One is from this French space agency, and it's the most developed in the sense that it actually flew on Earth. Uh, it's Mir, Montgolfier Infrarouge. Um, it was developed uh, late 1990s, beginning of 2000s. Last flight was in 2004. Uh, so this was quite a well-developed uh, project, but it was specifically designed for the uh, for an Earth utilization. Now, if you want to look at uh, Martian airships, uh, NASA actually developed uh, a project. It, it sp they spent. Uh, more than 10 years studying the, the, the issue and uh, led some very interesting studies that we actually used uh, uh, during during this year. Uh, it, it's called the Mars Aerobot uh, Balloon Study, um, if you have, want to have uh, more information on it. Um, and that was also in the same time as the CNES. So that was about uh, 1990s to beginning of 2000, I would say. But yeah. uh, of, of what I believe, I don't think they even they ever tested a prototype <laughs> to go back to the previous question. Yeah. Um, it was only uh, purely a development of a, of a study, not uh, and, no testing or validation. Yeah, and, and I saw the question was also about Venus in particular. Uh, I would like to add to that that what makes uh, Mars very uh, challenging for airships is really the fact that the atmosphere is so thin. So, for example, on Venus, uh, the air density is roughly 300 times bigger than what of that of Mars. Uh, so, you can imagine how this is a big driver because, as Romeo said, um, to have to be able to float, you can you cannot have like a critical radius where the envelope mass is less than the uh, lift power you're able to generate with that volume. Uh, and so on Venus, you would have 
very tiny systems able to float already. Whereas on Mars, what makes it very hard is that you have to have big systems. Um, so this is the main difference with other planets is really the, that has been considered, that have been considered for airships. Uh, it's really the atmosphere that is seen. Thank you for that answer. Uh, I think that was great. Um, I don't see any more any more questions in the chat. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any any other questions uh, and would like to ask them uh, live. If not, I have questions of my own. Um, so uh, you mentioned that that of course concept. I mean the the concept of operations, um, particularly transportation and deployment. Um, even though it's critical to to assess the feasibility of of, of any system we we launch into space. You haven't looked at it yet. I'm a bit surprised that it's also not part of the future project. Is there a reason for that? Uh, are you planning on doing that at some point? Uh, why is that? Hope to do it later. We just didn't have it yet. But, uh, this is uh, what we expect to, to do sometime. Of course, uh, deployment is very important and very difficult. So, but of it can. It can come only after other problems have been solved, it, because it's no point uh, deploying something which will not be operate, operational. So we have to see uh, what is the minimum or the minimum uh, uh, configuration we we can uh, we must have, and after that we see how we can deploy it. We, I think we it's difficult to do it before. So maybe uh, next year. <laughs> understood understood yeah, yeah go, ahead. And also, go ahead yeah and also we don't have all the hypotheses to, to with, with regards with what possibilities of fairing we will have in the future so maybe we don't want to put too much constraint on that knowing that maybe in the future you would have more fairing possibilities towards mars this is also one of the reasons we didn't quite investigate into that too much yet we are discussing it uh... So often, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess it's part. I mean, it's, it's on your minds all the time. Um, I, I, that's why I was I was just curious to learn more about how you're thinking about it. And I totally understand if you're you're planning on looking at it a bit later. Once yeah. you under, once you know that the technical aspects are clear and well understood, then it makes sense, makes total sense. And um, just just on the topic, uh, maybe to add to the discussion, I don't know if you you perform any type of of trade offs at the beginning of the study with other airborne systems. Um, because I'm, I'm I'm a bit more familiar with with um, fixed wing uh, Mars planes. Um, I remember seeing those studies back in the 2010, uh, 2011 maybe from JAXA, uh, doing some studies on 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 airplanes for Mars. I don't know if you'd look into that, and if so, what's the main benefit or pros and cons of yours of the of the airships? The the problem with the plane is that it has to fly very very fast in order to get some lift. So uh, we, we prefer to have this uh, airship because it can uh, observe uh, at very slow speed. And so uh, we can uh, even maybe perhaps come back to places which are interesting. With a plane, we'll go very well. I don't remember how much, uh, what the speed, uh, 50 times as fast as, uh, I don't know, remember the, the number which is to, be, um, to get some uh, to get some lift it's yeah, very it'd be, it'd be more than 100 knots so it's very fast and the takeoff and landing would be a real problem yeah yeah exactly and also that's a problem the operation will be extremely complex as you might be aware there is no landing or uh, there is no <laughs> landing uh, spots neither like uh, airports on mars so um, yeah. Operationally, that would be a bit difficult. Um, we we could have a, we could rotate the, the the propeller, so we could have a um, horizontal propellers to get uh, up, uh, to get off, and uh, after that we can uh, rotate the propeller to uh, to transform them. Uh, as a plane propeller, but of course, uh, then we still have the speed problem to, to keep uh, floating, to keep uh, flying in the air. So it's not uh, it really, it was not our project. Mm -hmm. Understood, understood. Um, I don't, I don't have any any further questions. I don't know if anyone else have any any questions. Um, otherwise, 
unless uh, the team has any any further comments, I think we can we can close it here. Um, so I don't I don't see any hands up or more questions in the chat. Uh, so thank you, thank you everyone again. Thank you to the team. It was very interesting presentation. I'm quite looking forward to see uh, the next iteration of the study uh, this year. And, um, and yeah, thank you all for for being here.